struggle when I'm not, things aren't going right, perfectly right. You know, I uh, love to have control and I like things to be smooth for, you know, the next thing to happen without having to have a break. I, I like, I respect that people have busy lives and I want things to go well for them so that they enjoy. So I try and remove all distractions. But sometimes distractions happen. Sometimes life gets in the way of me trying to control things, right? <laughs> I don't know if anyone else is control freak like that as well, but okay, we've got a few, yeah, okay. That's why I took up watercolour painting because uh, watercolour, when you're painting with watercolour, has its own mind. You can put it on, you would think you got it there, but it moves and seeps into other parts. And, and it's an effect you can use, but that's why I do that, because I have to lose control and just let the thing do itself. So it helps me to, to relax and relieve that. But things happen in life. Things get in the road, and our plans sometimes can be this way. And then life happens. Loud cars go past. I, it's a manifold blessing, yes. I've been uh, in, Bund in, in Billa Wheeler preaching and this magpie decided to, to start singing. So we just paused and listened to the magpie singing. It was lovely. Sometimes we just need to stop and just appreciate things that are going on in our lives. I want to talk about uh, that and our life, our devotions and our quiet time with God. And the verse that comes to me after saying all this... Uh, about stuff getting in the road comes from James. James chapter 1, verse 2 says this, Consider it great joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face various trials. Thanks. Thanks, guys, for writing that in there. Consider it great joy. Um, I, I don't know about you, but I think, what's, what's God saying here? What's, what's the writer saying that we need to have great joy whenever you experience various trials. Is it, does it mean that we have to say, I'm looking for trials so I can be grateful? No, it's saying that in spite, of the, in spite of when this actually happens, trials come, we can still see joy in spite of it all. And he goes on to say why this is so. He says, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance produces endurance. When, when our faith is tested, it produces the endurance that we need to face the next thing. When you make a, a, a chair, John, and you make a chair and uh, it looks wonderful, it's beautiful, uh, it's sitting there, but is, it, is that what it's meant to do, to sit there, the chair? You're actually meant to sit on it. So you test it by sitting on it and putting it under stress. And then you go, yes, this actually works. Or if it falls apart, I didn't, you know, I forgot to put the screw in this side. I, I just, you know. So we need to, our faith is tested and we do come across testings and we uh, see if our faith has endurance. And I guess it depends on what we have our faith in. And James is talking here about our faith in God. When we put our faith and trust in him and it's tested, we can see that, it actually has some nous to it. It has some gumption to keep going. And we're able to learn from the things that we experience to put that screw in if we didn't put it in, to put that part of our life in our discipleship with God into place. It goes on, it says, and let endurance have its full effect so that you may become like babies? No. So you might become mature and complete lacking nothing. This is something to look forward to. When we're tested and we're running through trials and we're going through struggles, that we can actually become more mature because of them. That's why coming to church is important because you, you, it's filled with humans <laughs> and we don't always agree with each other, right? We might rub each other up and do things differently or not the way I would do it and we, and we have no control of what others are doing, but it helps us to mature and rubs off some edges and we might rub off on somebody else. That's why we like purpose groups, Bible studies, life group, whatever you want to call them, TLC groups. That's why we like them. That's where you get together and you encourage each other. Not everyone agrees, not everyone gets, you know, gets it. Some are further in their faith, some are starting out, some, 
you know, are mature, but they don't show it. <laughs> but we do that because it helps us to grow and we need to be in, in a purpose group or a Bible study or uh, a life group, whatever you, you're a part of, because it helps us to mature. It rubs off and we help each other in maturity. Now, if any of you lacks wisdom, this is a good, this is a good thing because I can put my hand up, I quite often lack wisdom. He should ask God. I think it's important. We should ask God. God, I, I know I haven't got the wisdom for this. I don't know what to do next. But God, I'm asking you. And guess what? He doesn't give begrudgingly. He gives generously and ungrudgingly. Ungrudgingly. I love that. And it will be hidden from him. No. No. It will be given to him who asks. If you ask for it, God will give it to you. This is a great assurance because I lack wisdom. I don't know everything, right? Some of you know that more than others that I don't know everything, right? <laughs> I think I've, I've fallen into, uh, in ministry especially, is I don't know everything and so I buy books on that subject and then I find out that that subject can have many different <laughs> ideas and many different thoughts on that and many different people have different ideas. Even if I limit it to Christians writing the book with doctorates in the Church of the Nazarene or Wesleyan, or if I even limit it to that, there are differences in that. What I need is something that is more safe and stable, and that's God's wisdom. And praying for that. Knowing God's will and his way. I watched the interview that... Uh, Jay Jones or Jay Johns uh, did. He's the canon in um, uh, over in England uh, of the Anglican Church and uh, one of the canons. And he was interviewing another guy who'd been in ministry for 70 years. And he said, To your young self, what would you say? What would you say to your young self? He said, Well, I've got many degrees now, but I would say to my young self, Don't go to seminary. Get to know God and get to know his, wor his word, know his will and his ways, and focus on that. This is interesting. This is a guy who's, a, who's got doctorates, who's, who teaches in the He's been in ministry for 70 years, but he said, I would stop doing that. I would just touch on knowing God, knowing his will and his ways, and studying that. He says, but let him ask in faith. So here's the condition that that James is saying that we need to have. When you ask, when you go back and ask for God to give you wisdom, you need to do that without doubting. Ask in faith. And even when you doubt, you say, Lord, help my, help my doubt. <laughs> if I'm doubting, Lord, help me not to doubt. But in faith, ask. For the doubter is like the sea surging, comes in, goes out, comes in, goes out, driven and tossed about by winds and rain. That person should not expect to receive anything from God or from the Lord. Being double-minded and unstable in all his ways. Do I put my faith in the books I bought, I buy, or do I put my faith in God? Yeah, I need to read, I need to see what other people are saying, but I need to spend more time with God and in his word. So we believe that we need to know God and not just sit, be satisfied with that. We also believe here at 190 Neptune Street, Member Family Church of the Nazarene, Engaged Church, whatever church name you've labelled this place and become your home, we, we believe that we need to know God and also to make him known to others. To know him first and then to make him known to others. But what do you do when your devotional life seems blah? <laughs> when things get in the road. Remember I talked about things getting in our road, life happens, one is when getting to know God, in other words, our, our, our devotional time, our time where we spend with God, whether it be 
strategic time or whether it be just as we're going along. What happens if that's become blah and things are just not happening, we're not doing it because we've just fizzled out? How do we make God known? We can't make him known unless we know him ourselves and so we need to spend time with him. So what can we do about the blahs? <laughs> Good. To know God and to make him known, we need to have discipline. That's a word we don't tend to like, do we? Discipline. Unless you're in the army, you know, you discipline. Uh, if you're a musician, you practice, you discipline yourself. If you uh, have a field of expertise, whether you are a doctor of any sort, you have, you practice, you, you discipline. That's why you, you spend years attaining that. And, and that's what we need to do as well as Christ followers, discipline ourselves to do it. And by faith, asking for God's help to make it real, to make it important and to get something out of it, even when we're feeling blah. <laughs> God, help us to have wisdom. Remember that? James 2, it talks about wisdom. James chapter 1, sorry, it talks about wisdom. Asking God, even in our time with him, God, give me wisdom to understand what I'm reading. It's so important to know God. No one. What does the word mean? It's to be aware through observation, inquiry, and, or information. That's a typical dictionary um, definition of what is known but it's more than that for a Christ follower it's actually a relationship is what we have we don't just read about God we don't just hear about God we experience God knowing God can we know all there is to know about God we got some really brainy people sitting here and there's some other brainy people out there in the world do you think that they could know everything there is to know about God no. Why is that? Because God is infinite, limitless or endless in space, extent, size, impossible to measure or to calculate. God is so much. We see that in, in Scripture. It says in, in uh, here we go, Psalms. We, we're, we're not in the Psalms this week, but Psalms 92 says, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth, the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. From the beginning to end, there is no beginning and end for God. You are everlasting. In Timothy, it says this, To the King of ages, to the Eternal One, in other words, eternity, Immortal, invisible, the only God, be honour and glory forever and ever. Amen. This is Paul writing and closing off this part of the chapter. God is eternal. He is infinite. Psalms 139, where shall we go from your spirit or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I take my bed to Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. A great comforting psalm, but God is everywhere. There is no place where he is not. Can we know all there is to know about God? No, we can't. But we can know truths about God. We can know truths about God. So our devotional life, our time when we spend with God, needs to be centred on knowing God's truths. And the church over the years have gone through and said, well, we know that God is one. He's, and we talk about a, a triune God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, but he's one divine essence. Deuteronomy and Mark talk about this. God is the creator. We know that. That's a truth. God is creator. God is personal. He's loving. John 3, 16. For God so what? Love. Love the world. Yes. God is sovereign. Psalm 115, 3 and Isaiah 46 talk about that he is sovereign, but he grants us free will. He can still be sovereign even though we can choose for ourselves. He still is sovereign. But he gives us free will, free choice. There are others. God is holy. God is love. God is just. God is merciful. God is omnipotent. God is omnipotent. God is omnipresent. 
In other words, God is all-powerful, God is, all pre- uh, God is um, all-knowing, and God is everywhere. Those, those three words describe those things. Omnipotent, omnipotent, and omnipresent. God is all-powerful, God is all-knowing, and God is present everywhere. We just use them words to explain all that. And God is immutable. In other words, he never changes. He always is the God who loves us. He never changes. So these are truths that we can study, that we can look at as disciples and go over these truths about God. We don't need to know everything about God. We just need to know the truths, to know God and to make him known. Let's get really practical here. Let's get really practical. I started off by saying I get easily distracted. I uh, want to control things and things that sometimes uh, just take over. Well, we can, we've got brains. Some of us have brains we use, and some of us, if we were to sell them, maybe we get more money from them because they're not used. But we have brains we can stop and think about things. We can say, okay, this has happened in the past. What can I do to mitigate that in the future? What can I do to stop this from happening? So there's something known as the squirrel syndrome. When we go to have time with God to get to know him, the squirrel syndrome. We get... So many things going on, we get distracted, you know. Our brain does, jumps around, you know, does all this stuff. We, we can get distracted about things. Uh, we can get to a, a tango to-do list syndrome where we actually are uh, thinking about all this to-do things that we don't have quite in our brains enough to be able to spend time with God. It's, it, our brains are jumping all over the place. Maybe we don't feel comfortable whenever we have time with God. Maybe there's something that, that's happening around us that just is another distraction, but we can't get comfortable to know God or to spend time with him. Some, some practical things we do. We say, we know this happens. One of those things might happen to you. You might have something else that happens to you. But you have a mind and you have a God who wants to give you wisdom to overcome those things. And here, here are some ideas. Find a nice quiet place in your room, a corner. It doesn't have to be a log, pla- a log, a log cabin. Um, it can be. It, it, it might be just a corner of your house and you set up a really comfy chair one that keeps you upright, one that doesn't let you go back and sleep, but one that's comfortable, one that you can sit in, one that keeps you upright but it's comfortable and, the, and you surround it with stuff that just is calm. Maybe light some candles as you go to that place. If you're into that sort of thing, it just helps you to see the flame and just to stop everything else going. It can help the squirrel syndrome. It can help the to-do list syndrome to have a, a spot. It can also help you with the comfort. Sometimes you might feel too hot, too cold. Think about that and say, okay, well, it's coming into winter. I'm going to put a blanket just there and not touch that blanket. It's, that's where it's going to go. I'll keep it there. Or a fan that you buy just for that area and you can have that there. So it's always there. You don't have to search for it. Have this spot in your home. And if you're anything like me, there's so many things going on, do a brain dump before you actually sit down. Write down and write down stuff that's going through your brain. Write it down on a piece of paper. Take a photo of it and go, I know I've taken a photo of it, it's there on my phone, I can get to it later. Do this. Brain dump, write out stuff. And then maybe even have a piece of paper and a pen next to you so if something pops into your head while you're having quiet time with God, you can just write down there and, and just say, Lord, I'll give you this, and you know that it's there. You don't have to try and hold it in your head. They've discovered that we have too many open loops in our minds. Too many open loops where things are constantly going through our minds. What we're going to do? How are we going to move forward? Recently, I went on, on, a, on a holiday and somehow decided that we, it was a good time to pull out the kitchen and put a new kitchen in. And then they decided that the time for the roof to go on instead of next year. So the roof, we've had a roof and uh, all that sort of stuff, people coming into my home, which is my last space of protection. And, and there's people over my roof banging and kind of pulling things off and blah, blah, blah. You know, so there, there are distractions when we can mitigate those by doing that. And I was thinking through these things and then dumping it out on a piece of paper just helped me close that loop of worrying about what's going on. 
close the loop of I need to, to, to do something about this, write it down. It helps to close those loops that we try and hold things in our minds. It's not good for us. You might say, I don't, I don't write, I don't journal. That's fine, you don't have to write, you don't have to journal. You just have to get it out of your head onto something that you know you'll go back to later on so you can pick it up again. It doesn't matter how old or young you are, we have so many things on our minds. And so doing a brain dump, putting it on paper, helps us to close that loop so we can then focus on other things. The last thing is to, and maybe the first thing we need to take with us is the Bible, of course. I strongly recommend a real Bible, a Bible that's actually physical, that you can leave in that spot. We have wonderful Bibles on our phones and that, that's fine. But having a physical one helps remove the, the uh, beeps and alerts we have on our phones. But have a Bible. Have something that's paper there. Have a devotional book. I've, uh, these two have been great devotional books over, over my life. So E. Stanley Jones, something that my father-in-law uh, gave to me, one of those, and it has been just a blessing. You can buy heaps of his as well. I love him. He's very deep and very thought-provoking. So if you want that, if you want something that's actually challenging and very E. Stanley Jones, something a little bit lighter is uh, uh, Craig Rochelle. Uh, he's just very short and biffy and challenging. That's, that's another good... There's, there's many out there. The Christian Book Shop has got some. If you are interested, come and see me, and I'd love to help you with that. It just helps direct you back to the Scripture and helps you to get something and apply... You know, it gives you some ideas that you just might generate something. So having quiet time, having a place where we go to... And we read God's word daily. In the morning, like Jesus, got up early when there's no other distractions, when people can't reach you. That's why I like to try and get things done in the morning. If I have an appointment, I'll try and have it in the morning because later on, things interrupt. We have brains, we can think through things, we can create situations better for ourselves. And so we can, with God's help, and with his wisdom, we can think through these things and place things in our life to help us with our quiet time with God. So how do you think about God through the day? Is there something that you do to help you remember God throughout the day? Having a, a devotional book is wonderful, but when you leave that devotional book, how do you remember what you've just read? You know, writing it down on a piece of paper, what you've just scene or something that's challenging, carrying that, like a, a library card or something like that, or even take a photograph with your, with your phone and leave that app open so you can see it. Take that with you throughout the day and, and meditate on it, what you've just read. Have that piece of card and think about that through, because your day is full of other things. God would like to be with you through that. That's a great way of doing that, is to take that into your day by doing those things. If you're fortunate enough and you have a phone and you know how to use the alarm, <laughs> put a, an hour alert on your phone. Every hour, beep, 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 you go, oh, okay, uh, God, I need to say, Lord, thank you for this day. If you're like me and you like coffee, um, you know, every time you make that, oh, I'm sorry about this dodgy drawing, this coffee, and you're there stirring it, looks like a shovel, doesn't it, sorry, you're stirring it, or you're putting the beans in, or you're putting the water in. Think about, God, thank you for the person who grew these beans. Thank you. Thank you for the person who, uh, um, I want to say cooked them, but that's not the right word, but, you know, yes, the beans. Lord, thank you for the maker who, who, who came up with the design of you know, putting this together. And, you know, it really helped. I've got a rake which is this uh, thing that's on like a, a brush that looks like a, you know, those brushes you put on for, um, you, you, if you're a bloke, you had, you know, shaving cream in the old days. It looks like that. It's got these little fine, and I use that to help when I grind the coffee to make it just, it's like playing in sand, right? <laughs> but it slows me down, and I'm able to think about it. it. It separates the coffee so it's not chunky, so it'll actually go through better. So there's a purpose for it, but it slows me down in the process. I'm able to say, Lord, thank you for this that I'm able to actually have this coffee. And if you have coffee four or five times a day, that's four or five times a day where you've actually been worshipping God as well. So that's my last point. Connect your worship with God to something you already do. Connect your thoughts about God with something you already do and make that part 
of connecting with God. If you want to change a habit, you connect it to another habit, the, the new thing you want to do. You connect the two together. If you want to start it, uh, uh, being aware of God, connect God and being aware of him to some other habit in the day. For me, it's coffee. And it's a good excuse for me to say, I need another coffee because I need to get, you know. Connected to another habit is a great way to be in, 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 in a worship time with God. So I hope you found that helpful. I hope it's a good reminder to know God and to make him known. You have to know him first. And to know him first, it's time, it's a relationship. You can pray for wisdom to know how to uh, approach that, to find ways to make that a part of your life. Let's, let's, let's finish this part with prayer and then we'll sing a song and we'll have morning tea. Father God, we thank you for the blessings of uh, your scripture where we can know you through the words and through the lives of those that have gone before us in your word. We thank you for the uh, bibliographies, for the, for the lives of, of those uh, that have gone before us in this world that are even currently facing many things that we can actually read about their lives as well or watch videos about their lives that encourage us and point us to you. Help us to set timers on our interaction with media, with the things that are going on in the world that we would come off Facebook and all these other things too, Lord, that distract us, Lord, that we would use our minds, Lord, as we go into our quiet time in the mornings, as we spend time with you, help us to think about the things that can distract us and to put things in place that will help us not to be distracted or to be less taken away from those that time with you. Lord, it is so important and we thank you for the example of Jesus who before others were awake and while it was still dark he slipped away and had communion with you. Lord, if he needed that, we so much need that. We pray that you would help us as we seek to know you, as we seek in our, to have a, a relationship with you, to know your will and to know your ways. Father, help us, we pray, this week to put something into place. 